Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is Mike Kresnick, and uh, I've been uh, serving uh, the church as a deacon uh, for the last um, eight or nine years or so. Been on staff 10, um, 11 years now. So, uh, but I, I am pleased and joyful to, to be standing here preaching Psalm 24 this morning. Before we dive in, um, like Dusty said, we've been preaching through the Psalms for the summers for the last um, decade or so. And uh, three years ago, we started preaching at Psalm 1, and we're preaching all the way through one by one um, every summer. And so we're at Psalm 24. And this year in particular is special because our art show uh, for the next two months is all related to the Psalms. And it's artwork from the people of Coromdale Church from children to adults. And so I encourage you, check out that art exhibit, um, if not today, anytime this summer. Um, There's even a couple art pieces uh, about, are inspired by Psalm 24 as well. So check those out. Check those uh, beautiful art pieces out. Um, We just heard Psalm 24 read. And I want to point you to the most repeated phrase in the psalm, the core question in the psalm, specifically found in verses 8 and 10, who is this king of glory? We just wrapped up preaching about the kingdom of God a few weeks ago, and so again we find some kingly language used in the psalm, and I want to just think about this question for a moment. Who is this king of glory? One of the foundational aspects in the scriptures as as the scriptures talk to us about God, it says that he is glorious. What does glory mean? Glory refers to God's splendor and abundance and significance. We often use the word gravitas to describe something weighty, someone's character, their strength of leadership. We will we'll use the word gravitas to describe that. We could ask, who is this weighty king? Who is this king of great worth, this king of splendor? John Piper says, the glory of God is the going public of his holiness. God's glory And his abundant splendor is on display to the world. And that's what we see here in Psalm 24. He is revealing his holy and perfect character and attributes. This God is glorious. He is weighty and we must reckon with him this morning. But our problem in really engaging Psalm 24 is that our sense of glory is is off. Think about what's glorious in your life. What holds weight and importance? What gets the most of your time and attention and energy? What do you consider to be worthwhile and significant? When I take a step back and I take an audit of my life, just in the past year, a few things came to mind what are weighty and significant to me. One of the first things that came to mind is, is my status and my security in my job. Another thing that came to mind was I, I want to be seen as brilliant and impressive to people. I want to be approved of. I want the affection and attention of my wife. These things are weighty and important to me. And society tends to make similar things important too. Celebrity, wealth, educational achievement, achievement in sports or our career. And here's my concern for us as a church. Most of us would say that we love God and we are here this morning because we want to worship God. But we struggle to be impressed by him. We are not captured by his glory. Psalm 24 is helping us solve that problem, this this problem as old as humanity. If we look at the Old Testament, we can find that people's desires and fears for longing and prosperity and safety always overwhelm their sense of God's glory. 
In Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve. We see their longings and desires to be like God, leading them to exchange the glory of God for things far less glorious. In the book of Exodus, chapter 32, God has displayed his powerful love to his people in Egypt, delivering them from slavery. And at the foot of Mount Sinai, they form a false god out of their jewelry and and look to it and say, this is the God that has delivered us. Instead of worshiping the one true God. Later, we see Israel's kings allured by military power and excessive wealth. And then God's people follow in their footsteps over and over and over again, always being allured by lesser glories of sex and money instead of being captured by the glory of God. The psalm is intended to help God's people become reoriented to who this king of glory is. And this morning, I want to show you in a real and simple and beautiful way how Psalm 24 helps us see the glory of God and why he is the king of glory worthy of our praise, worthy of our worship and adoration and obedience. What you are going to see in this psalm is that God is glorious because he is triune. He is three in one. And now this psalm doesn't give us a full and robust doctrine of the Trinity. We'd have to look at Tons more scriptures than what we're going to look at today. But what I do know is that the triune God existed before the creation of the world. He existed before the writing of Psalm 24. And I want to show you that Psalm 24 has a triune structure. It shows us the beauty of this king of glory in language that reflects the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So as we open up to Psalm 24... Uh, or page 428, if you're using one of the Bibles underneath your seats. Uh, I want to read Psalm 24, verses 1 through 2, and we're going to see how this King of glory is God the Father. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who is this king of glory? He is the one who has established the world and who rules over everything and everyone in it. And when we talk about creation, the scriptures usually ascribe the work of creation to God the Father but not exclusively to God the Father, because, for instance, in Colossians 1, talking about Jesus, we read, He is the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. And like we also read in Genesis 1, at the creations of the heavens and the earth, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of God. Of the waters. But in classic Trinitarian theology, when we speak of the work of creation, we're talking about the generative work of God the Father. We're thinking about God establishing the earth to be a place that can sustain the life of humans and every living creature, including the first man. And woman who are made in God's image. God said in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image. Adam and Eve and all of humanity after them were created bearing the image of God. Created to tend to the garden and be fruitful and multiply. The reality that God is the creator is is one of the most basic and foundational truths of theology. We teach it to the youngest of children in Coram Deo Kids because it's the foundation of being impressed by God. If you can understand that God is the creator of the world and everything in it, it's easy to be impressed by this king of glory. I remember sitting in my Sunday school with with my teacher, Miss Maggie. She was talking about creation and how God created the world. And I asked her, Miss Maggie, who is God's mom and dad? 
And she looked at me, and I remember her smiling and, and laughing at the innocence of the question, but just my lack of understanding. And she said, well, God has, God has always existed. God was not created. God was and is and will always be. And my mind could not grasp it. And even now, as I think about it as, a, as an adult, I still can't wrap my mind around this glorious idea that God is the uncreated one and he is the source of all things. It's glorious. But the world tells us a different narrative, doesn't it? Modern society tells us that God doesn't exist. The creation story is a myth. We write our own story. Life is what you make it. You create your own significance and meaning. You do you. You control your life. Nearly 150 years ago, William Ernest Henley wrote in his poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And we have a tendency to let that story shape our hearts. Sometimes we rush past these first two verses of Psalm 24 because we haven't been captured by the King of glory and his creative work around us. And if we aren't captured by this King of glory and creation, we won't find his rule and authority in our lives glorious either. So what's so glorious about God creating a world and creating every living thing? Well, he created this world and everything in it for you to seek him and find him and know him and experience his love for you. That's why the creation of the world is glorious. From every pink and orange sunset to every meadow lark, from every grazing cow to every human being, from every microorganism all the way down to the permafrost and molten core of the earth, all of the scientifically known facts and all of the unknown mysteries, every atom and element, all of it belongs to the king of glory and he delightfully created it all with the intention for you to seek him and find him and enjoy him forever. That's why the creation, and God's creating it is glorious. Herman Bobbink explains in the study of God's general revelation, in, in studying his revelation to us in creation, our concern must be a concern to know God. Its primary purpose is to lead us through the creatures to the creator and cause us to rest in the Father's heart. And when we ponder and, and take in this beautiful creation around us, wherever we're at, whether it's in the backyard of our suburban home or at the Grand Tetons, the purpose of the universe is to bring us to God, the Father, the King of glory. Historian George Martin says, the universe is an explosion of God's glory. Perfect goodness, beauty, and love radiate from God and draw creatures to ever increasingly share in the God's, Godhead's joy and delight. The ultimate end of creation, then, is union in love between God and loving creatures. Who is this king of glory? He is God the Father who desires that his image bearers, every man and woman, are caught up in his love. How do we get, a, get caught up in this love? Well, the next part of Psalm 24 is going to show us by pointing us to God the Son. Let's look at verses 3 through 5 together. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. What we find here is that to ascend to God in all of his glory and in all of his holiness, to receive blessings from being in his presence, we must meet a moral and ethical demand. 
For one to ascend to God, he must have clean hands, referring to his outer life. He must have a pure heart, referring to his inner life, the the life that you can't see, the hidden life, if you will. He must not lift up his soul to what is false. He must not lift up his soul to meaningless idols, nor swear deceitfully, referring to how worship of the one true God go hand in hand with loving our neighbors. He who does these things and is this type of person will receive blessing and righteousness from God, the God of his salvation. This is the type of person we want to be on our best days. And this is the type of person we know that we are not on our worst days. God's people in the Bible didn't meet the standard either. The scriptures show us that in the Old Testament, they were cast out of the holy place and exiled to foreign nations. Why? Because while some appeared to have holy outer lives, their inner lives were far from holy. And others' lives were corrupt altogether, outward and inward. All of their sins could be boiled down to the fact that they were not faithful worshipers of the one true God, and they did not love their neighbors. And this isn't just ancient Israel's history. This isn't just the church's story throughout history. This is the story of every human being that has walked the earth. This is the story of you, and this is the story of me. Every one of us knows that we fall short. And we know that the world offers us strategies to to make up for our deficiencies, doesn't it? I want to share two that we might be familiar with. The first one is, look within yourself. The solution to fix your problems and imperfections is within you. Second, compare yourself to others. If you could just find someone else who is clearly a racist or clearly a misogynist or a hater, if you compare yourself to them, then you can feel pretty good about yourself, can't you? takes the edge off of your guilt. Psalm 24 gives us a a different strategy. It it gives us a better solution to the problem. Verse 6 shows us, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Verse 6 is saying that those who seek the face of God, the face of the God of Jacob, will become People who have clean hands and a pure heart. God of Jacob is a relatively rare phrase in the scriptures. It's used only 23 times throughout all of scripture, and 12 of them are in the Psalms. So what is this psalm hinting at by referring to God as the God of Jacob? You may remember a story in the book of Genesis, Genesis 32, where Jacob is wrestling with God through the night. And as the sun is rising, as the morning dawns, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What a bold statement to say to God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. God blesses him. And Jacob says in Genesis 32, verse 30, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. This is a big deal because when you see God face to face, you typically die. You're overwhelmed by his glory so much you can't live. So by referencing the God of Jacob, Psalm 24 is hinting that for us to be clean and pure, for us to receive the blessings and righteousness and salvation, we must, like Jacob, cling to God and not let go. We must seek the face of God. And when we do that, here's where it leads us. To Jesus Christ. Listen to 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 6. And notice how it uses this, the exact same themes and imagery in Psalm 20, as in Psalm 24. For God who said at creation, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
Where do we see the glory of God most clearly? In the face of Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1 tells us. When we seek to stand in the presence of God and stay in the presence of God and find blessing and righteousness and salvation, the only way to find it is in Jesus Christ, God the Son. For Jesus was sinless. He ascended the hill of the Lord. He stood in the holy place. His inner and outer life was holy. He fulfilled the vocation of a son of God on Israel's behalf, worshiping the Father wholeheartedly and loving his neighbors fully. He received blessing and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And he shares this blessing and righteousness in salvation with all who trust in him. Look at Hebrews 12. Listen to what it tells us. For it, was, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies, for he who makes holy... And those who are sanctified, those who are holy, all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Some translations say he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Jesus is that big brother we've always wanted who doesn't abandon us, who doesn't pick on us, and is not ashamed to say, hey, he's my brother. Hey, she's my sister. Because God, the Son, Jesus took on flesh and became like us, he now invites us to be united to him, to be made holy like him, to share in his glory and his blessings and his righteousness. Seek the face of God. Cling to God, the Son, Jesus Christ, and don't let go. Be united to him. Receive the blessing. Receive the righteousness. Receive the salvation. Who is this king of glory? He is the God of creation, and he is the God of your salvation. This king of glory is God. <clears throat> Excuse me. God the Father. God the Son. And finally, the king of glory is God the Spirit. As we turn our attention to Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10, we'll notice a shift in theme and tone. The first six verses seem to be describing this king of glory, telling us how we can be with him. These next verses are showing us how to prepare for the presence of the king of glory. Look at verse 7 through 10 with me. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. I can almost see the people running through Jerusalem and opening the city gates and the priests opening the temple doors and longing for this king of glory to come and dwell with them. Open the doors, open the gates, let nothing get in, get in, away, get in the way of this coming king of glory. Because the thing about glory is that we don't want to enjoy it from afar, we want to be near it. That's why we get excited when we bump into a celebrity at the airport or we see Warren Buffett and Paul McCartney eating ice cream in Dundee. We want to be near someone weighty. We want to be near someone glorious in the eyes of culture. There's something about celebrity that is magnetic, isn't there? It draws us in. And we read stories of the Old Testament saints being confronted with the presence of God. You see that they're afraid, but they don't run away. When Moses comes across the burning bush in the wilderness, he doesn't run back to town, but he kicks off his sandal so he can stay in the presence of God. 
When Joshua confronts the commander of the Lord's army, he doesn't run away in fear, but rather he falls face first into the ground so he can stay in his presence. When Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, is having the vision of being in the temple of the Lord, he doesn't try to wake himself up from the vision, but he becomes undone so he can stay in the presence of God. God's presence is weighty and holy, and it's also captivating. The end of Psalm 24 shows us God's people desiring for the king of glory to come in, to to dwell with them. The language of opening the gates and the doors shows us that they want God's presence. And the way we experience God's presence is through the work of God, the Spirit. We don't have to open these physical doors of 8787 Pacific Street for God to show up. These doors and gates are metaphors. It's a picture for the disposition of our hearts. Church, throw open your life to this king of glory. He wants to come in and dwell with you. He wants to fill you up with his presence, his joy, his fruitfulness, his wholeness, his every moment of life ministry to your souls. Isn't this awesome? The king of glory that that created the whole world wants to come and dwell with you. How do we know this to be true? Because in John 14, as Jesus was preparing his disciples for his death and resurrection and ascension, he makes them a promise. John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Get this. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Shall the church now faint or fear when the comforting king of glory is here? This king of glory does not leave us to fend for ourselves. He's not going to leave you behind. God, through his Holy Spirit, dwells within his people and brings us into the shared communion with God the Father and God the Son. Check this out. The king of glory wants to dwell with his people when they gather on Sundays. How does this change how you enter into this room to worship? The king of glory wants to dwell with his people when they gather in gospel community. On a, long, on a Tuesday night after a long day at work, when it's Taco Tuesday, again. <laughs> the king of glory wants to dwell with you and your gospel community. The king of glory wants to dwell with you in every single moment of your life. How could this change how you open your eyes and your heart to the everyday presence of God and the ordinary things of life? Who is this king of glory? He is the triune God, the creator of heaven and earth, the word made flesh, the spirit who has come to dwell and make God known to his people. This is the God we worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Friends, think about all the other places that we seek for glory. Do any of them satisfy? Do any of them truly give you what your heart longs for? Maybe you thought getting married would fulfill everything, but now you're seven years in and you're realizing, oh, my spouse wasn't created to fulfill me, to satisfy me, to make me happy. You thought that once that you got to that place in your career, everything would be great, but you still find yourself bored on a Wednesday afternoon, wondering, is there something better? Maybe you're just looking for the next event on the calendar, 
or the next life milestone to bring some excitement and joy. And when that day comes and that moment passes, you're left seeking something else. There is a king more glorious than anything that we seek and beyond anything that we can imagine. You are invited to worship this king of glory. This king of glory is God the Father, the one that created you and gives you breath in your lungs. This king of glory is Jesus the Son who has come to redeem you and bring you into the love of the triune God. This king of glory is the Spirit of God who dwells with his sons and daughters and is dwelling with us right now, this very moment. So as I close in prayer and as we, as we move our attention to the Lord's table, I want to I invite you to embody this desiring for the King of Glory to come in. I invite you, if you're comfortable, if you're willing, if you actually desire to experience the, the, the King of Glory being present in you, I, I invite you to pray with your eyes open and your hands open with me. If you feel comfortable, I want, I want to invite you to do that. So let's do that together now. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you created and established this world so that we can seek you and find you and enjoy you forever. Grant us the grace to enjoy you in the moments of every day. You establish righteousness and salvation for us through Jesus. Grant us the grace to see the face of God and to believe and to receive salvation and righteousness from you. You have promised and given us your spirit to be with us forever. Grant us the grace to commune with you, to enjoy you, and to walk in your ways. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.